our objections from the tech people. Um, I think we'll make a start. Um, hello, um, my name is Martin O'Brien and I am participating today from Northern Ireland. Um, I am I'm delighted to have been asked by the organizers to facilitate this very important uh, discussion. Uh, I have a long background of work in human rights, in peace building and in philanthropy. And I'm delighted to be able to uh, be here for this, uh, for this discussion today. It's great too to see so many people um, participating and joining in the conversation. And we have a very rich panel of inputs today and perspectives, bringing contributions from states, victims, legal practitioners, and civil society. So I think we're in for a very rich and um, productive discussion. Um, unfortunately, our time together is limited and we have a number of speakers. So we may not be able to take questions, but we will try to um, do that and to do our best. During the session, um, your camera and your mic will be off. Um, so please use the question facility if you have questions that strike you and that you want to put. And if we don't manage to get to them, they will be of great use and value to the organizers as they think further about the issues that have been raised. And um, so please take advantage of that and, and use that as we, as we proceed. And if time allows, hopefully we'll get to one or two of them. Um, there is also a hashtag for the event, and that's hashtag reform UNCT. And I think people are encouraged to use that as well. So that's another way to, uh, to participate. Um, coming from Northern Ireland, I have direct personal experience of the importance of victims' rights, both in the context of the violent conflict itself and also in states' responses to it. Often the particular needs and concerns of victims are entirely neglected, while at the same time they're frequently used as political tools in the wider working out of conflicts. Failure to address the needs of victims can also be deeply damaging to peace processes and the building of healthier, more stable societies. Indeed, at this very point in time here in Northern Ireland, we have a, a live example of this, where a pension for victims has been painfully delayed um, amidst a whole series of political maneuverings. I believe that a human rights-based approach to vindicating the rights of victims offers a way forward and a way through these difficult and sensitive issues. And so I'm delighted um, to be, uh, have the opportunity to participate in this discussion today. Um, I'm particularly pleased to begin the discussion uh, with introductory, with um, uh, contributions from two, um, two states and some introductory remarks from them to kind of get the discussion, to get the discussion going. I'm grateful to Mr. Nasa Faik from the Permanent Mission of, Af of Afghanistan in New York and to Mr. David Izquierdo um, from the Permanent Mission of Spain, uh, who have joined us today. Uh, together, Afghanistan and Spain are co-chairs of the group of Friends of Victims of Terrorism launched last year in New York. And Afghanistan also presented with support from Spain and numerous others, um, a new General Assembly resolution last year on enhancement of international cooperation to assist victims of terrorism. So we're very well, very fortunate to have these two people with us today. Given the time constraints on our session, they and the other speakers each have five minutes for their remarks. We'll now hear first from the state representatives and after their contributions, I will introduce each of the panelists in turn before they speak. Mr. Faik, um, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director O'Brien, for giving me the floor and for inviting Afghanistan to offer introductory remarks ahead of uh, such an impressive and important panel. I would like to thank Ms. Jessica Morphy, uh, Ms. Sarah Hussain, and Mr. Matthew Pollard for being present in the panel today. 
We look forward to listening to you, uh, to your vital inputs on the matter. Uh, for the last 20 years, Afghanistan has been a country in the forefront of uh, the fight against international terrorism. Our country's efforts to stand against the threat which affects not only our country by our wider region and the world has given us a profound understanding on, on the pain and suffering that resulting from the actions of terrorist groups. The fight has been resulted in enormous sacrifices with thousands of innocent civilians being killed or injured by, those, by these groups. Just an example, during the month of May, there, uh, there was heinous terrorist attacks happened in Kabul on a maternity hospital that uh, due to that incident attack, women, children, and even newborn babies were killed. On the same day, there were a funeral session that was attacked by terrorist groups and mourners, they, were, uh, they lost their lives. And also at the same month, during the month of Ramadan, in a mosque, there was another attack by terrorist groups and worshippers while they were waiting to break their fast, they were killed. These are some of the sad stories. However, even though the suffering and the distraction feels very local to us, we also understand that we are not alone in this matter and understand the importance of building resilience, building a strong network of international solidarity and partnership to understand and work through the effects of terrorism. As such, Afghanistan has worked with the UN in passing of two milestone resolutions dedicated to recognizing the experience of victims of terrorism and the importance of leaving nobody behind. As such, in 19 December 2017, Resolution 27 165 was adopted, establishing 21st August as an inter international day of remembrance of and tribute to the victims of terrorism. This was then allowed in June 2019 with the passing of resolution 73-305 on enhancement of international cooperation to assess victims of terrorism, in which member states' commitments to victims are emphasized, in particular through a call for the development of comprehensive assistance plans to support victims of terrorism. This, the last resolution further urges member states to develop comprehensive plans in order to provide both immediate and short-term assistance to victims and to ensure that the voices of those affected are given the attention they deserve in the aftermath of the attacks as they will build their lives. To strengthen the, to strengthen the mandate of this resolution, the Group of Friends of Victims of Terrorism was launched with Spain and Afghanistan as co-chairs. The Group of Friends of Victims of Terrorism seeks to promote a comprehensive approach toward the promotion and protection of the human rights of victims of terrorism and to advocate their diverse needs in short, medium and long term. The group will seek a balanced implementation of United Nations global counterterrorism strategy with a focus in, on pillar first and pillar fourth. As, uh, as well as the relevant General Assembly UN and UN Security Council resolutions. Since the launch of the group on 25th June 2019, the group has held expert level meetings to discuss important topics on the matter. Also, with the active participation and coordination of UN Office Counterterrorism, uh, we have held our first ministerial meeting co-hosted by co-chairs of the group and office of UNOCT on 21st, 24th September 2019. We hope to continue to expand on our important activities and also find spaces for the participation of civil society. And I will, uh, I will stop here. I know it's, I already spoke uh, lengthy uh, and I will stop here and I leave the other parts with uh, my colleague, uh, David, from Spain to elaborate further on this subject. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Faik, um, and thank you for your discipline on time as well. Very much appreciated. Um, Mr. Izquierdo. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to start thanking the organizers for the invitation to Spain to participate in this very relevant event as well as uh, thank the rest of the participants in this uh, panel for your presence here with us. I think it is very important to keep the momentum about these issues 
in these special times, and initiatives like this one are very helpful for it. The protection, assistance, and recognition of the victims of terrorism has been a priority for Spain in the last decades due to our, unfortunately, long experience in the fight against terrorism. It has been in the top of our agenda both domestically and internationally. Let me begin by presenting briefly some of the characteristics of the Spanish system of protection of the victims that I think may be important for this panel. First, the Spanish system is defined by a comprehensive assistance approach, both at the time of the terrorist attack and in the medium and long term, including not only the compensation and financial aid, but also other types of services and benefits that meet all kinds of needs that a terrorist attack can cause to a person. This protection enjoys legal basis. In order to further guarantee this integral assistance, a draft protocol of action is now in the last phase of its normative processing. The main purpose of the whole system is to put the victims at the central position, organize the different measures taken into consideration their specific needs with a strong involvement of the victims during all the process of creating and enforcing these measures and treating each of the victims as individual trying to restore their dignity and their rights, their human rights and their political rights. Second, throughout the years, it has become increasingly clear the importance of working with the different organizations and entities involved in all the process. Civil society, and especially the associations and foundations of victims have played and play a crucial role in the development of these measures, as well as in giving the victims and their needs special visibility with the support both economically and institutionally of the public institutions. Other entities such as professional organizations are also involved. The General Council of Psychology of Spain, throughout an agreement by which a national network of psychologists specialized in the care of victims of terrorism has been created. And also the collaboration work has involved the judiciary with the creation of an office for, an attention, for the attention of the victims and finally, the coordination of administrations has also included the participation of different institutions at a regional level, autonomous regions, and a local level, which is very important for practical uh, and many uh, other uh, reasons. As the last remark from our domestic experience, I would like to highlight that the Spanish legislation provides the same assistance and rights to all victims of the attacks in Spain, regardless of their nationality, as well as to all Spaniards victims of an attack, regardless of the country where the terrorist attack took place. There is no distinction made based on the origin of those who have suffered a terrorist attack in Spain. In the international arena, Spain has actively participated in different initiatives. And in the last years, I think we can agree that important progress has been made with the work of all of us. As my dear friend Nasir pointed out last June and presented by Afghanistan, Resolution 73305 on international cooperation to assist victims of terrorism was adopted. Two important remarks should be made regarding this resolution. First, it was adopted by consensus, a point that has to be put into value. And second, and at the same time, the resolution defends the need for international collaboration, therefore stating explicitly, and as we said, by consensus, the need and good effect of a multilateral approach and international cooperation. Also one year ago, as Nasidia said, the group of friends was created, including now more than 40 countries. Its main purpose it is to promote a comprehensive approach towards the promotion and protection of the human rights of the victims. As mentioned, in this year, the group has already organized and participated in many events, such as the International Day of Remembrance and Tribute to the Victims and the first ministerial meeting of the group of friends. And we are currently working to continue the work of the group at different levels. I am finishing now, moderator. Other important developments have taken place in the last months. The, SG, the Secretary General report on victims of terrorism published last April constitutes a guiding reference in this field. The celebration of the European Day of Victims of Terrorism last March 11 was a remarkable event. Different initiatives by the UNOCT should also be underlined as examples of the progress made. Among others, the United Nations Victims of Terrorism Support Portal. And the celebration of the Global Congress of Victims of Terrorism will undoubtedly be a landmark in the treatment of this issue, and we are willing to participate actively in its organization. Looking at all this, it seems that the protection of the rights of the victims 
is one of the issues that enjoys ground for consensus. And this creates, for one side, opportunity, but also a responsibility for all of us, since we, it shows that we have the duty of working for the implementation and strengthening of the existing instruments in order to try to alleviate the pain and restore the rights of those who have suffered the consequences of a terrorist attack. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Esquerdo. Um, um, so I think that those, both those uh, remarks give us a very nice um, jumping off point for the discussion. And I'm very appreciative um, of both, to both of you for taking the time and participating with us today in this important conversation. Um, I'm going to turn now to introduce um, Jessica Murphy. And Jessica is a teacher and researcher currently living in New York um, City. She's a member of September 11 Families for Peaceful Tomorrows and has written about her experience of visiting Guantanamo Bay as a victim family member. So I think it's very good to start off this part of the discussion with um, a voice directly from a, a, a victim. So Jessica, you have the uh, microphone. Uh, good morning and thanks Martin for uh, inter the introduction and thank you to all the co-sponsors for hosting this event. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to connect with you all. On September 11, 2001, uh, my father was killed in the attacks on the World Trade Center. Uh, my life changed overnight, and as I grew up, I watched the after effects of September 11th change the world. The US government rushed to respond to the attacks at times in ways that contradicted the values it typically claims to promote. Uh, one such value is justice. 19 years after September 11th, today, the five men accused of plotting the attacks have yet to be fairly prosecuted for any crime. They are currently in holding cells at a now infamous detention center on Guantanamo Bay Naval Base in violation of international law. They have been charged with nearly 3,000 individual accounts of murder for each victim of the attacks, along with a series of other crimes. We've recently learned that in the years after they were kidnapped, the detainees, as well as hundreds of other people, were disappeared and tortured by the United States. The atrocities that took place were not only blatant abuses of human rights, but also an impediment to justice. Confessions tainted by coercion undermine the legal process, especially as the government attempts to hide its actions. Although the government maintains that they were acting for the victims, it feels as if my voice has been co-opted. I am deeply saddened by the violence that has taken place since 9-11. And I'm frustrated that victims like my father are used as an excuse for counterterrorism measures that violated other people's human rights. Uh, while Guantanamo Bay is certainly a unique situation, uh, this reality, the deprivation of justice and the disregard for human rights is common in cases related to terrorism around the world as we're hearing today. Um, family members of 9-11 victims are relatively fortunate, however, in that we're granted limited access to the judicial process. Trials have yet to take place, uh, but family members are selected by lottery, five at a time, to travel to Guantanamo Bay and watch pre-trial legal proceedings, so long as no classified information is discussed in the high security courtroom. In 2018, 10 years after the first round of pre-trial hearings, I participated in the victim witness program and participated uh, on this journey to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, in court, prosecutors repeated the number 2,973 again and again, reminding us of the number of lives lost on 9-11. As they repeated the statistic, sometimes in arguing for the death penalty or in response to defense lawyers mentioning the government's own transgressions, it felt to me as if they were using our loss and pain to justify further violence. After witnessing the hearings and learning more about Guantanamo Bay, I joined the peace advocacy group, September 11th Families for Peaceful Tomorrows, where I connected with other victim family members who are equally committed to preserving human rights and seeking nonviolent responses to the attacks. Um, the concerns raised in the panel this morning are my concerns. 
I know firsthand the importance of justice in cases related to terrorism. And I want to emphasize that victims deserve a voice in this pursuit. States should not instrumentalize victims for political purposes. When governments violate human rights, it undermines justice. We need to hold states accountable for their actions and undergo proper and comprehensive investigations without acting inappropriately, illegally, or violently in the wake of tragedy. When counterterrorism measures violate human rights, it creates more victims and harms victims of terrorism. I and my family need closure and justice, but not at the expense of other people's rights. Hundreds of family members of 9-11 victims, including members of my family and other members of September 11th for Peaceful Tomorrows, have died waiting for justice for their loved ones. And um, when counterterrorism measures violate human rights, more victims are created and more pain. While states may claim to act in victims' names, they aren't necessarily acting in their best interest or the public's best interests. Uh, it's my hope that we can hold governments accountable for their actions and create more sustainable approaches to counterterrorism and victims' rights while pursuing justice. Thank you very much, Jessica, for those heartfelt comments, which set a very good um, context for our, um, con our, our conversation today. And, really bring it home to the individual um, the individual level. Um, I'm going to call now on Sarah um, Hussein, who's a lawyer at the Supreme Court of uh, Bangladesh and serves pro bono as executive director of the Bangladesh Legal Aid and Services Trust. Um, Sarah is also a partner in the law firm of Dr. Kamal Hussein and Associates and she has acted on a wide range of human rights matters and among other achievements played a role in drafting Bangladesh's first legislation on domestic violence, which came into effect in 2010. In 2010. So Sarah, you have the uh, floor. Uh, thank you, Martin. Um, I'll speak from the perspective of a human rights lawyer in Bangladesh, where civil society activism has been really critical in demanding justice for victims from the inception, from 1971 and the genocide until now. But the discussion around terror and counter-terror really stems more or less from the, fourth, from the Holy Artisan Bakery attack, which many of you will remember, and the fourth anniversary, which is approaching on the 1st of July. This was the incident that brought the issue of terrorism and terrorist violence into international headlines. And it was really from then that we started understanding and talking about counter-terror as well. And also at the same time about the concerns with human rights violations that occurred during counter-terrorism, because both disappearances and extrajudicial killings have been alleged to be part of the state's response to that militant attack. This wasn't the first time this kind of violence had happened. I mentioned, of course, the 71 genocide, and it wasn't even the first time it had affected the international community. From the 1990s and 2000 onwards, we'd seen incidents of extremist violence, attacks on writers, poets, development organization, cultural organizations, uh, progressive political activists. But it was from the 2000s that we first saw the, that increasing powers were being taken on by the state to counter terror with specialized laws, forces, and tribunals, with the exceptional violence of terror being matched by a response that created an exception to our ordinary criminal laws and procedures. And this happened in a situation where we already experienced, on the one hand, impunity in cases of serious crimes and human rights violations with perpetrators rarely brought to account. And on the other, we experienced systematic abuses of these criminal laws with arbitrary arrests, detentions, and custodial torture being widely reported. So this dual denial of justice, impunity for victims, and the creation of new victims of human rights violations was exacerbated and it found new forms as the state began to address the so-called war on terror. And we've seen how an almost routine state response to the threat of terror has created new victims and further undermined the rule of law, eroding public confidence and trust in the justice system and instilling a culture of fear in ordinary people, inhibiting them from seeking justice. And this in turn has undermined the possibility of democratic accountability and the scope for building a secular and equal society where rights and justice are protected by law.
Periodic counter-terror operations have resulted in extrajudicial killings, secret detentions, and disappearances. And anti-terror laws we've seen have been combined with intensive surveillance, undermining the rights to freedom of expression and freedom of the press, so that we can't even monitor human rights violations clearly. Existing criminal law protections, for example, to be produced before a court and protection against torture have also been undermined, as we see white vans drawing up outside citizens' homes in plain clothes, midnight arrests, and secret detentions. I'll just give one example, I think, out of the many. Um, the use in many, and in many cases, the flagrant abuse of our anti-terror laws against dissenting voices, and the seepage of the rhetoric of terror into anti, so-called anti-state activities, or hurting the image of the nation, an actual offense, has acted to stifle legitimate political opposition and civil society voices. In one case, that of the killing of the terror killings of Julhas Mannan and Ahmed Rabbi Tonoy, two very prominent LGBT rights activists and personal friends and colleagues, the, the case against the, regarding their killing remains pending. But at the same time, high state officials continue to deny that the LGBT community even exists in Bangladesh. Julhas, who was killed in, in, 20, in, one, in this killing, Julhas' his own brother is now incarcerated and facing possible conviction for hurting the image of the nation for his comments regarding the government's performance during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we see that many victims of terror also face this two-pronged threat of extreme violence of an attack by terrorists or extremist groups on the one hand, and the risk of prosecution and loss of liberty under draconian laws simply for speaking out and exercising their rights as citizens. To conclude, I'd just like to, uh, uh, I'd just like to, uh, I think, ask for four demands from governments to ensure access to justice for victims. We have people who are still facing uh, trials which haven't concluded 21 years after particular incidents of terrorism. For governments to include victims in measures for fulfilling their rights, informing them of the progress of investigations, involving them in the conduct of legal proceedings, not to exploit victims of terrorism, exactly as Jessica has said, not to rewrite and use them in rewriting the histories and our experiences, but to allow them to speak and to direct their own narratives, and to finally to abide by their obligations to provide asylum where required to victims of terrorism. We see a lot of international cooperation around terrorist financing and terrorist organizing, less cooperation around refugee protection and asylum being granted to those who face threats uh, in, their own, in their own countries. Um, and to civil society finally also a, a, a demand, I think, that to, uh, we should not, in supporting victims, we should not endorse or share platforms with political groups or individuals who act in violation of basic human rights principles of equality. And we should again, in supporting victims, also look at how protections, refugee protections can be provided and how we can monitor situations of immigration detention. Um, I'd like to end my remarks then. Thank you again to the organizers. Thank you very much, Sarah. And again, a lot of very practical um, points and concrete um, um, interventions in those remarks. And um, thank you very much. Um, we're making good time and we, I'm about to um, call on our final presenter. So if people have questions, do please put them in the box. We may not get to them, but there is some scope, hopefully, unless, Matt, you become very, uh, uh, very, very long-winded. Um, uh, I'm delighted uh, to welcome Matt Pollard, who is based in Geneva. And Matt is a senior legal advisor for the International Commission of Jurists, um, a global association of judges and lawyers. And the ICJ has been working since the 1950s. And in fact, um, there were a number of ICJ interventions in Northern Ireland over the years, which were very welcome. Um, and that work has been focused on promoting the rule of law and legal protection for human rights. Matt is the main representative of the ICJ um, at the United Nations and also heads up ICJ's Center for the Independence um, uh, of Judges and Lawyers. So Matt, do you have the um, microphone? Thanks very much, uh, Martin, and, and thank you to the other speakers uh, for having shared their uh, essential experience and, and expertise with us today. Well, um, I'm going to speak about what we're call, we, we call a human rights-based approach to, to victims, mainly focusing today on victims of terrorism. 
And uh, I'd refer everyone to a publication that we put out at the ICJ last year, which compiles together all of the United Nations and regional sources on human rights of victims of terrorism uh, that we could find, which is available on our, our website. Well, I think we've already heard uh, the first message um, quite clearly, which is that uh, the civil society role is essential in realizing a human rights-based approach to victims. And here, uh, we really need to think about a wide range of civil society, associations of victims of terrorism, humanitarian associations, uh, uh, human rights organizations, uh, academic and research experts, and, and uh, really a wide range. And um, as has been mentioned, uh, we see from the, the international and regional sources that it's, this needs to be not only in promotional work or um, uh, in countering terrorism in the media, but also uh, concretely in developing, implementing, and evaluating measures of assistance to victims, including, I would say, particularly now, the very valuable process of uh, national action plans mandated by the Gen General Assembly resolution um, presented by Afghanistan and adopted by consensus last year. The second important point, I think, is uh, to emphasize the need to move beyond expressions of solidarity with victims of terrorism to concrete measures. And here, there is already such a wealth of guidance, information, and good examples um, in publications from the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, uh, regional uh, instruments in Europe and elsewhere, all providing really detailed guidance I was interested to learn just this week that UNODC is in the early stages of um, preparing model legislative provisions um, to uh, uh, entrench support for victims of terrorism. So there's a lot of material out there. What I think is um, an important element when it comes to a human rights-based approach is that measures for victims should be grounded in legal frameworks, that the administrative measures should be designed to be efficient and effective, keeping in mind the experience of the victims, and states should not wait for an incident to begin preparing uh, for um, the, what's needed to meet the needs of victims. Well, some of the overarching principles of a human rights-based approach that emerge from all the different sources that are out there. First, uh, measures need to be designed around victims' particular needs with their involvement and being grounded in a legal framework. Uh, the measures need to be enforceable by the victims where they need to do that. Victims need to be treated as individuals, entitled to dignity and humanity, and entitled to respect and protection for their human rights. Uh, victims need to have access to a remedy and reparation. The point of non-discrimination, which David mentioned uh, early on, is a very important one in this context. Um, and also, a human rights-based approach needs to be sure that the measures respond to specific needs and context without creating hierarchies in law or practice between victims of terrorism, uh, different kinds of victims of terrorism, but also between victims of terrorism and other kinds of victims of violent crime, of counterterrorism measures, and so on. Uh, effective, rapid, and simple access to assistance is key, of course. And here, thinking beyond just compensation, uh, you know, the need for medical, psychosocial, legal, and financial support should all be part of the mix. Um, it's important that the right to assistance or compensation not be dependent on identifying or convicting particular perpetrators. Uh, sometimes that's a general requirement under criminal law and systems, and, and this is something that should be um, addressed in this context. Uh, access to justice and truth, we've heard from, from Jessica and, and others. Uh, definitely, this is key that victims be informed of investigations, able to observe or participate in trial proceedings, uh, be informed on the timely progress of investigations and trials, be able to challenge decisions not to prosecute, able to present the impacts on them when it comes to sentencing. And uh, as has already been referred to several times, wrongdoing, illegality, excessive secrecy and human rights violations against the suspected perpetrators, or even just casting the net too widely in counterterrorism measures and investigations can ultimately impede the criminal trial and punishment of those responsible, and so impede the right to access to justice and truth of the victims of terrorism. So governments need to be sure that they see proper and legitimate counterterrorism practice as not only about promoting the interests of the state, or of the individuals accused of terrorism or of the population as a whole, but also as essential to realizing the, the rights of the individual victims of terror attacks as well. Finally, uh, or almost finally, in, in terms of um, the recurring themes, some things that we see come out of all of these different sources, uh, 
Uh, first of all, recognition and remembrance is definitely an important element. It's probably the one that is most often uh, implemented by states, and, and so there is a need to go beyond it, but it certainly remains essential. Avoiding exploitation and re-traumatization is a second important recurring theme. Preventing further attacks or violence, of course, is, is an important um, aspect of, of ensuring non-repetition at the same time while respecting the rule of law and human rights for all the reasons that we've discussed. As I say, ensuring that there's a role in designing, implementing and assessing victim support measures uh, for the victims themselves, that they are not only seen as consumers, but as um, active participants in delivering uh, uh, the measures. And finally, to return to where we began uh, with Afghanistan and Spain, Absolutely, international cooperation is key here. And, and I certainly agree with what was said at the beginning. These last two years have seen really a remarkable amount of progress uh, towards international cooperation in assisting victims of, of terrorism. As I've said, um, we'll be working, have been working, we'll continue to work to make sure that that incorporates a, a human rights-based uh, approach at all levels, uh, global, regional, and national. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, I'm grateful to everyone for those very um, thoughtful contributions on the topic which doesn't often get the attention and kind of cross-dimensional attention that um, we have represented here in the panel today, um, having lots of different perspectives brought to bear on it in a, in a thoughtful and responsible way. Um, there are now um, a number of questions that have come in and maybe I'll put um, a couple of those together um, uh, to the panel and we'll see if we can get through those um, and see if people have responses to those. So the first of those is, can the panelists speak to the transformative capacity of having alliance and partnership between victims of terrorism and those who have been subject to human rights violation by the states. We have seen such common ground on rights in a number of countries. Um, and then a second question would be, how do we address complex victims? Here, for example, we think of women and children who may have traveled to Syria and Iraq. So two questions there, and I'm wondering if um, uh, Jessica or Sarah or Matt um, have uh, a particular um, uh, reaction or response to any of those questions. I'll have a couple more that, um, uh, but I wonder if anyone wants to take the opportunity to respond. So one complex victims and the other alliances between different types of victims. And maybe that's something Sarah that, that you or um, Jessica that you might want to, um, to comment on. Would Jessica like to go first? Um, I can add a, a brief comment um, that the first question definitely um, brings up a good point that that victims are not necessarily um, a monolith uh, and have different perspectives and opinions. And uh, that's certainly the case with uh, the, the September 11th trial or trial that will eventually happen. Um, people have different um, concerns, but I, I do think alliances are critical um, for connecting both victims of the same attack and also across countries. And um, there are different organizations bringing together youth that have been victims of uh, terrorism um, in different countries. And I, I think that there's great potential for that. Um, and in terms of complex, um, complex victims. I think, um, I believe it was um, Matt or Sarah, you both raised the really crucial point that um, increased cooperation for refugee protection um, is, is, should be a priority um, in this, in this conversation, um, especially when there are other factors besides simply the, the attacks creating the, um, the terminology of victim, but the pre-existing conditions and the other factors. So coordinating on a state level um, in terms of protecting people who are displaced or no longer have a, a safe place to, to be. 
I just wanted to add a comment as well. So, so in our context, we've seen um, the families of the disappeared, um, for example, have organized as a whole, but because of the, uh, it's very difficult, they, and they have formed some alliances with other human rights activists and professionals, but it's very challenging and difficult for them to get broader solidarities because of the kind of delegitimizing um, of them that is attempted and the way in which um, the terror narrative is used to spread like a contagion to anybody who tries to stand in solidarity with them. And I think that's also something very important to resist. And one way to resist that is if the victims of terrorism can work together with the victims of the family of the disappeared, um, uh, that that connection would greatly strengthen and enable them to function effectively. And as, as Jessica rightly said, victims are not a monolith. So even if someone is a victim of terrorism, they may be different in their views from another person who's a victim of terrorism. There are very real debates to have and very different views people have, but the space to have those debates is not always there. Certainly in a, in a country like mine, it's very difficult to do that. And I think that's one of the places to work. And on the other point about, I think, complex victims, again, from our context, we know that Bangladesh is hosting a million uh, Rohingya who have escaped genocide, but the Rohingya also, individual Rohingya are also now facing extrajudicial executions effectively, so-called crossfire killings by the security forces. And again, it's not really an issue we can work on uh, very easily without again being labeled and targeted and so on. So I think th those are definitely issues to consider in terms of how we can move forward. Thanks, Sarah. I'm wondering, Matt, if you want to come in on the complex victims point, if you have anything to add to that. Sure. Uh, yeah, on the first point, I would just uh, just mention, I have heard of initiatives like this uh, around the Bataclan attack uh, mm -hmm. in, in France. So I think that is important. But of course, the human rights based approach would be, you know, victims sh should decide whether that's a kind of um, alliance they want to build or not. Mm -hmm. And some may and, and some may not. On complex victims, I think that, you know, there are many, many common elements. In fact, at the most general level, uh, the elements of a human rights based approach to victims of terrorism are, are the same elements as uh, victims of counterterrorism measures that have resulted in human rights violations. But of course, how those elements apply to different kinds of victims and individual victims depends on the context. And uh, so, um, uh, you know, there is a, a, a fundamental uh, asymmetry in some ways in that victims of, of um, of counterterrorism measures may or may not have themselves uh, uh, perpetrated terrorist attacks. So um, this is not something that's kind of reflected on the side of, of victims of terrorism. So I think that's important to acknowledge when thinking about, you know, the way to, to build different uh, actions around these things. You know, the fact that someone is, is a victim of a, a human rights violation as a result of a counterterrorism measure doesn't mean they're innocent of the accusations against them. Uh, on the other hand, the need to bring that person before justice uh, doesn't in itself mean that all of their rights can just be uh, brushed aside in, in the, in the um, pursuit of bringing them before justice. And I think Sarah has, has described some of the impacts on the rule of law and uh, the justice system as a whole when the justice system, system is sort of seen as an impediment or just brushed aside um, in, in pursuit of, of, um, of a kind of retribution that doesn't follow uh, the values of, of the society that's seeking to impose it. So I think complexity of victims is a, a challenge, particularly when it comes to up, upholding the rights of um, victims of, of counterterrorism measures that have violated their rights because uh, they may at the same time indeed be perpetrators who have to face responsibilities of, of their own, which is not uh, really reflected uh, in the same way for victims of terrorism. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering, we might try a couple more. Um, I just see um, a question here. I wonder if the UN and other actors in this field could consider elevating the voices of victims and their families by supporting them to be at the forefront of advocacy, communications, and other activities on issues of counterterrorism, not as a token, but really in a leading role. And a question for Sarah. Could you please talk a bit more about how victims of terrorism experience the response of the state to terrorist attacks? So those are two. There may not be time, but I don't know if anybody wants to come in on um, one or other of those. Sarah? Yeah. You need to unmute. Yeah. Yes, sure. 
Um, well, in different ways. Uh, with the holy artisan attack, for example, two of the individuals who were victims, who were in the building at the time and fortunately survived, uh, two young men, they were actually held in detention for months on end and were not able to get uh, legal representation. I wasn't able to represent them myself for the kinds of reasons that I explained earlier. Um, and eventually these two were released, um, but not, after, not before they had been completely vilified in, in the national press and, as I said, left without representation for a long period um, and no doubt have been very deeply affected by what happened to them. For others, um, for example, um, and Professor, the father of Deepon Rai, a publisher who was uh, murdered, hacked to death in his office. Um, his father, uh, who's a well-known progressive um, person and intellectual, said he didn't even want to seek justice. He had no faith in what he really felt was the most important thing, was to build democracy. So I think we also have to see, talk about the causes of terrorism, you know, what, why it's happening. And this understanding people also have that creating new forms of violence, like Jessica was saying, actually undermine what many victims were fighting for in the first place. I mean, many people who believe what they believed in and what they wanted. So again, I think there are different experiences of victims of terror, but there are also many who perhaps do want just quick justice because there's so little faith in the judicial process because of the undermining of institutions and their erosion. For many, perhaps what the state is offering, which is quick just justice of a kind, which we wouldn't recognize, I think, in an, under international norms or even our constitutional norms. Um, for some people, that is, that is the answer because of this sense of frustration that nothing else will happen. And I think that's where, as human rights advocates, um, there's much more to be done in standing with them and um, working with them rather than taking only one side of the of the discussion and why this discussion on victims around victims of terrorism and victims of human rights violations of counter terror has to be brought together they can't we can't sit in one of those spaces and not in the other thank you sarah i just wonder jessica if you have a final very short word that you want to say before i try the uh, difficult task of summing up a few a few points that strike me you're on mute jessica Thank you. Um, yeah, I do think uh, it's important to add that different cases have have varying political power and often that goes unspoken, but uh, certainly in the case of the United States, 9-11 um, has a, um, you, you say it and people, people have a reaction, um, whereas in other cases that, that certainly is not the same. And while that's not necessarily um, embedded in the system officially, I think I think that's worth acknowledging. And um, certainly the the examples that Sarah discussed, um, you know, she, it was she alluded to that same thing. And so I think it's important to recognize the political power that comes with this and also um, the vulnerability of, of people of victims who who lack that power and who are in in different situations. And that almost goes back to the complex um, situation we discussed earlier. But um, thank you all for um, being here today and for um, preventing more victims uh, as we recognize the rights of victims of previous situations. Thank you, Jessica. And um, I suppose I'd, I'd like to just try to pull out a couple of things, not in a comprehensive way, because it's been a quite a wide ranging a set of issues we've covered. Um, but it seems to me there is a real advantage in adopting this kind of human rights-based approach to victims, both to victims, and I think we've heard people arguing for the need to kind of bring, and Sarah said this more recently, um, the need to bring um, our perspectives together on the different sides of this, and in particular, adopting a human rights-based approach both to the victims of terrorism and to victims of violation in the context of countering terrorism. And certainly that's something which resonates here in the Northern Ireland context. The main elements of a human rights-based approach are common to all kinds of victims. And these include, I think, non-discrimination, reparation, rehabilitation, satisfaction and access to justice and accountability. And a human rights-based approach grounds these elements in legal rights that victims can effectively enforce at the national level. Unfortunately, victims are often left kind of scrambling for goodwill and a bit of a favor instead of having their rights grounded in some kind of legislative basis. 
for him. I think another issue which has emerged here and again is relevant in the Northern Ireland context is that there should be no hierarchy of victims, which is often the temptation which people fall into. And involving victims in the design and implementation for um, uh, measure, to, to implement measures that fulfill their rights and address their needs must be really at the heart of this and again is sadly too often um, done. I think there is also a warning here about governments not exploiting victims of terrorism by invoking them or their suffering as a purported justification for then going on to introduce certain measures which in turn violate rights and potentially also um, create more victims. And uh, that is, um, you know, I think it's quite important that governments focus on addressing the needs of victims and the vindication of their rights rather than um, what sometimes seems to happen, which is victims becoming victimized again um, in the process and in the discussion. Um, many victims of terrorism, and I think Jessica alluded to this, many victims of terrorism don't get justice um, because sometimes the state's response and the efforts to actually pursue things um, invalidates the efforts and mean that people actually get away um, and justice isn't done because the rule of law hasn't actually been respected. And I guess ensuring a rights-based approach to victims of terrorism and victims of violations in countering terrorism helps build stronger justice systems and a culture of the rule of law, which in turn, I think both enhances the credibility of counter-terrorism strategies and their effectiveness in removing conditions that are sometimes conducive to terrorism. So those are a few kind of remarks that I think capture some of the points, but obviously don't do justice to the breadth of um, discussion here. I'd like to conclude by thanking David, Nasser, Sarah, Jessica and Matt um, for their participation and for their very um, thought-provoking and thoughtful uh, comments on what is a, a, a hugely important issue which um, we need to get right if we are to move forward towards creating more healthy, stable societies, but also if we are to ensure that the dreadful wrongs that have been done to people aren't actually compounded by a lack of a response or a poor response. So I am um, on behalf of the organizers, I'd like to thank our panelists um, and I'd like to thank everyone working behind the scenes who made this um, event possible. Uh, please um, uh, do uh, uh, use social media um, to respond and also continue to feed in um, uh, your questions and thoughts and reactions. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of those, but they will be considered um, by the um, by the organizers. So I think on that note, I will um, bring things to a close and uh, just wish to thank um, all of you for your participation in what's been a, a really great conversation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Man.